Teresa Beamken, CEO of National Speakers Bureau and Global Speakers Agency. We're one of North America's original speakers bureaus, and we envision a world where the sharing of ideas inspires action to make the world a better place, and especially through bringing expert speakers and thought leaders to your conferences and events, whether it's in person or online as we're doing these days. On behalf of our team and our speakers, we're delighted you could join us today in this community of clients, colleagues, event planners, HR and diversity leaders, and more. We've got six thought leaders to help us with our theme of people and culture, learning to care for ourselves, our teams, and our communities. Each speaker will have about 15 minutes, including Q&A, and will run about four till about 4.45 p.m. And we so appreciate you joining us. So I will kick off the introduction of um, our host for the day. He is Tony Chapman, who is a communications trailblazer. He ran the hugely successful agencies Communique and Capital C for many years and was recognized early on as the youngest Marketing Hall of Fame award winner. He has the ability to help audiences and clients really see the special value of their offerings, connect with the unmet, unmet needs of customers, and take you on a transformative journey. He's a speaker, conference host, and host of Chatter That Matters. He recently partnered with RBC to host the Small Business Matters podcast, where he helps business leaders find support and inspiration to navigate these challenging days. We look forward to being in your good hands through this virtual summit, Tony. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Not only one of the first speakers bureaus, in my opinion, to the best, so I really appreciate you uh, letting me be part of it. I wanted to begin by telling you that there's just one word that's always mattered to me. I think it's the most important word in the human vocabulary. And I think it, if you think about it, it probably is to you as well. In other words, attention. See, attention is the oxygen of all human endeavor. I mean, it's the only way a teacher can teach, a parent can mentor. It's the only way we can transform, revive, and rebuild and engage. It's the only way we can put people first is to get the attention that we deserve. Problem is, is that in many cases, most brands, most institutions, most leaders, most of our ideas are starving for attention. It's not our fault. We're in a world where there's too much and too many chasing a finite amount of time. We're actually drinking from a fire hose. And even though what we put in that fire hose is, is so special and so important, it often gets spilled on the floor. So six years ago, I did leave my agency world and I knocked on Teresa's door and I said, I want to take this message to the world. I really believe that I have a way to get the attention that you deserve. It could be you're in human resources. It could be the leader of an organization. It could be your company's coming up with a new brand. But how do you have it stand for and stand out? Especially in these days where so much of it is locked within screens. So I created a whole new platform about storytelling, but not the traditional way of how does Disney tell stories, but what is your role in storytelling? How do you help people get to a desired outcome? I'm not going to talk about that today because I'm, focusing on my hosting duties, but just wanted to tell you that, that it was about attention. The next thing I found is I was doing these conferences, and it was all over the world. Very often, they were eclectic. There was a theme, but there was a lot of different speakers and content. Some people on stage were exceptional, and other people, you could see people just reaching to try to escape uh, to their phones. In this case, just putting on a mute button. So I started putting myself forward as a host. I said, I don't want to just be this MC role. I actually want to be your third party, the journalist. I want to be the person at the beginning of the conference that can invite your audience in. Tell them they're going on a quest. Today, we've got an important quest. We're going to learn about people and culture, the tiebreakers in organizations. We're going to fill our knapsack by listening to some incredible people. And then throughout the day, I would pop up on stage and, and encourage speakers to maybe spend less time talking one way and more time with interactive conversations or have a fireside chat or moderate a panel. And in doing so, I could take a core idea and just drive it all the way through the organization. At the very end, probably the most important thing I would do is wrap up of what we learned on our quest. And when I, by doing that, the end, when people come back and say, was that good investment spending a couple of days at that Zoom conference? Did you get good value? They say, absolutely, because that core compressed idea we'd unpacked for them and given to them as a gift. And that's what I do as a host. I'm hoping that you'll see some of that today. But right now, I want to turn it back to Teresa to introduce our first presenter. Thanks, Tony. And uh, we really appreciate the way that you can bring a conference together and uh, weave all the threads through. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and uh, we now have our first speaker, 
uh, Nova Nicole. You will have seen her as a wellness expert on CTV's The Social, and she's now a leadership development facilitator at one of the world's most successful companies, Shopify. Nova's skills are in providing tools and mindset shifts to help us navigate our own self-care and make for more effective workplaces. Today, she'll share with us personal leadership habits for managing your time and energy. Welcome, Nicole. Nova, Nicole. Nova, Nicole, still the same person. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, good morning, afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and greetings from whatever planet we're calling this now. Um, I'm glad to be here with familiar faces, and it just feels good to touch base. Even though we're not touching, I can feel all of you, and uh, I know some of you are familiar faces, so welcome. So, some things have changed. What's, uh, what's new? <sighs> Let me just catch my breath as I wrap my head around the real talk that's been coming up when it comes to managing our energy, our time, and just showing up in this new normal as leaders in 2020. And there's a few things I wanna to touch on. It's about authentic leadership when it comes to how we're processing this information, how we're decompressing in order to do that, and how do we find balance and really model and embody that practice for ourselves and for our teams? So in the past, well, in the past few years, um, since joining NSB in 2014, I have crisscrossed North America speaking to the academic, uh, professional and private sectors about how to really integrate wellness into your life and really everyday being, knowing that the bridge between personal development and professional achievement, they're connected. We can't have one without the other. And so the sooner that we start having those conversations and normalizing that behavior, knowing that wellness a restorative rest and all the things that come with it is a requirement of high and optimal performance. The more we can just factor it in that they're one and the same, the easier it is to embody that practice. So that's what I've been doing for the last few years. And now that I'm working at Shopify, which feels like I live on a rocket ship, it's been really important to be a part of this incredible Canadian company and to really validate and affirm that this is how we do things. And this is really, this integration is how we can change the way that we live and work. And speaking of changing the way we live and work, COVID has turned everything upside down. And I guess the good news is that it wasn't from us, not from our workplaces, not from our performance. It wasn't outside that we had to adjust to and adjust we have and adjust that we have. And the challenges that have come from that um, are, are on every level and have permeated all aspects of everyone's life. Hasn't it been interesting to hear how no one really has an advantage in this time, unless you're David Geffen on a yacht, but on a super yacht, I'm sorry. Um, unless, you know, everyone's has, we're just been evened. And if it's you're a caregiver or you're living alone, um, everyone's struggling with their own challenges of grief as to what's been lost as to times before or the grieving the plans we had for the future. People are really trying to adjust what, what does work look like now uh, for myself or with an agency without audiences, without human connection, without hugs and touch? How does this change the way we parent, the way we work, the way we grocery shop, the way we live? And it's really week by week by week. And I think many of us can reflect on how things were in the first days of COVID, let's say the first 30 days, as to even how we have developed now, that things have definitely changed. So while those challenges are evolving, there are some tools that have shown up that have surfaced and uh, that I think are really working for people in the conversations that I've had. And the biggest takeaway I've heard is that while it feels we have more time because we're home and stationary, it uh, doesn't mean we have more capacity. More time does not mean more capacity. And so with that, time management, uh, while it seems like a solution, it's energy management that we're after. 
because it's our energy that's something we can manage. So I do want to share a bit of a slide, just speaking a bit to those quadrants as to how that energy management can change, what those emotions look like when they surface, so that we can have the awareness to step back, engage, and then make a new decision. So give me just one moment while I share this with you. Okay, so if everyone can see my, my screen here. So we've got these four energy quadrants, and this is from Tony, Tony Schwartz from Project Energy, who's really come up with this, um, this content. And we've got four quadrants here. So there's the survival zone, and you see me looking, I'm looking at our, my monitor, survival zone, performance, there's recovery or renewal, and then there's burnout. And in energy management, it's not about avoiding burnout or avoiding survival. We're really just limiting the amount of time that it is that we spend there. And that's really what we're is to try and change our awareness on. So you can see the feelings and emotions that come up when you're in that survival space, which, you know, irritable, impatient, uh, frustrated, angry, so much of what's happening to us is out of our control. And when you see yourself in burnout, it's sometimes I have to say that's the appropriate response to processing the news of the day. I know my, myself when it's come to uh, issues that are in the news uh, surrounding Black Lives Matter and anti-racism, burnout, you know, and all the feelings attached felt like the appropriate response. So again, none of these are negative feelings. We're just trying to be mindful of how do I cycle through these quadrants? How can I be aware of managing my energy so that if I'm not in performance, then where am I? And how can I have performance and recovery running side by side, running underneath one another? Because what I'm hearing is that people going from performance, when I'm in the zone, when things are working well, right back to survival, just juggling the 49 bowling balls. So how do I have performance and recovery run together so that I have the performance and I schedule it in, I factor it in, that time to recover, that time to decompress in the same way you operate a machine is that you don't, you don't just leave, you don't drive across country and leave the car idling all night. You have to have time not to just turn it off, but long enough to cool. Because just like anything else, you will cause irreparable damage if you're not having that regular maintenance and the self-care, the wellness practices, all of these things that you've been discovering or leaning into in this time, that's your new foundation. That's what it's time to apply to that recovery zone. So whatever that looks like for you, I've heard all kinds of all kinds of tools that folks are leaning in on. Um, and, if it, and if it's the meditation or the time outside, or even just feeling refreshed about leaving another room or changing clothes and putting on pants, if that looks like recovery to you, then hats off to it and do more of it. But that burnout and survival, it's not, again, not to avoid it, but simply to be aware of it and knowing that how it shows up for yourself so that you can recognize it in your teams. And with that said, it's I think it's the, the best place to move to is to a space of really authentic leadership. When it comes to processing this information, decompressing and balancing, leaders need to model and embody a new leadership for a new time. We can't measure productivity to days of old. It's just we aren't there. In, in this room you're seeing, this is a yoga studio, a grade one classroom. Uh, this is a home office for Shopify. We can't ask people to perform the same way when they don't have the same outlets for stress and creativity. They're lacking the same social connections. We have to give them and demonstrate the latitude that they need in order to do the work that we're asking of them. So when it comes time to processing, leaders, it's okay to not know everything. And you can say it out loud. This is my first global pandemic. This is my first time dealing with anything in this capacity. And we can reach a certain age where you, where you can kind of recognize, okay, I've been in this before and this is how I pivoted. This is not that. So to say, you know what, I don't know, I've never done it. I think it speaks real truth to power and shows your authenticity, shows your humanity. The second piece is, is when you don't know, take a step back, take a step back, do the work deep in the practice, educate yourself and then report back what it is that you've learned rather than trying to be reactive and have all the answers quickly and then iterate after because that wasn't the right answer. 
When it comes to decompression, it's crucial to set that schedule and then work around it. Set a schedule for restorative rest and then work around it. It's much easier to work around that schedule than trying to work it in. So if that means pulling back, looking at the calendar and plotting in those busier times, or if it pulls back and saying, okay, these are the hours in the day, even if it's five minutes between meetings to catch a breath, have a bio break, set that in the schedule and let that be the normal. When you can standardize that as your practice, people see it in your schedule, they will, again, will start following your example and behavior. And then finally, when it comes to balance, it's a word I don't love, but really aim for harmony. Harmony is different things working together, like an orchestra. It's different sounds, but they work in concert with one another. And knowing in harmony, sometimes it's 70, 30, 80, 20, 60, 40, but rarely is life 50, 50. And that's a lot of pressure to feel like things need to be in balance. So aim for that time that, uh, that you're working for harmony. Take that pressure off of yourself and your team. And a way to do that is to check in ask questions, check in with sincerity and not as a task list, but really, how are you doing today? How are you doing right now? And when you're asked, answer authentically, because it's not fine. It's not, oh, I'm good. You know, today was difficult, but uh, you know, tomorrow is all right, or I'm looking forward to such and such. Show that you're a human. That's helpful. And also uh, iterate quarterly as to what the needs are for the business, the needs are for your team, for your personal and your family needs. And then also as to what is this that's coming next in those busier seasons and times. There's so much to be changing. And I'm sure that we could have another conversation in six weeks and it would be totally different. But from March to now, really one season, this is what surfaced. This is what leaders are sharing with me. And this is how people are making this work. And we will. We may not get back to normal, but I'm hopeful that we can get back to better. I really am. Nova, that was uh, uh, fabulous. I, I gotta uh, confess, I've actually seen you in, in live and you're incredible. Oh. And you really, uh, because you have this incredible humanity and heart that comes out. People are really pay attention. And part of what you teach, I think, is, is to have people have the courage to be human beings. So imagine that I'm organizing a, a, a Zoom meeting. I've got a company, I've got leadership. We're all struggling to kind of figure out how to navigate. Yeah. What kind of role can you play in that? How can I bring you in and say, uh, you know, because you are a voice that really does have people feel about posit positive and possibilities versus, as you say, the sort of the, the lows and the negatives. So what role would you play? Well, I would, I'm always trying to influence the influencer, right? I want to talk to the people who take care of everyone. And what is it that you need as leaders and as leadership? And what does that conversation look like internally? And then how does that energy dispel down and out and across to the team? Because we're really only as strong as those who are embodying that example. So that's when I come in with those frank conversations, like what's working, what's not what are the challenges when the days are working really well, like to have you pulled back to say like, hey, this is when it's all clicking. This is what we're doing well. And what can be left behind? You know, what perhaps it was working, but what are you willing to leave behind? And then I'd like to do some future forecasting is what is it that you want? It's a simple question, but just like how are you suddenly holds a different kind of weight. What is it that you want uh, is something that I would sit with the leaders and that challenge them to really reflect on now. Some of your best work, obviously, then is working working with the leadership and then getting involved in the programming. So it's a combination of the two. I talked about attention being something that I'm passionate about, and I one of the most profound things that you said when I watched you was you're talking about a lot of people are scared to ask for what's important to them that they're, they're they're hesitant. Why is that? And what's your advice about for that? I honestly think people haven't given it a lot of thought is that we can be very reactive versus responsive to that questions when it comes to us. It's like, what do I want? Well, what do you want me to want? Or what did I want, you know, on my list of things that I felt like I was supposed to want? And all that's out, out the door now. If nothing else, what's important to us, who is important to us, why has really started to surface. And I think people if they haven't been prompted now, are getting a lot clearer as to where their values have changed, where their energy has changed. And now how is it that I actualize it? Now that I'm clear on what it is I want, and, and now that I know what I don't want anymore, where can I start to clarify, iterate, 
cancel some things out and really put the the finite time and energy that I do have into getting what I want. And there's nothing wrong with getting what it is that you want, because if you're doing that, then I'm going to want that too. And if, and I'll always say everyone does better when everyone does better, but you've got to know what it is that you're looking for first. Nova Nicole, it's a pleasure having you on and understanding the key thing I put in my knapsack so far is authentic leadership. The world's changed, so does leadership. Thank you very much. Teresa, back to you. Thank you. Tony, thanks, Nova. And uh, I think of you, Nova, regularly when I take my forest baths, which uh, <laughs> you had advised at one point for restoration, so thank you. Um, our next speaker is Michelle Falcon. And Michelle Falcon has immersed himself into speaking, training, and writing about people-first culture. He became a partner in launching a successful restaurant in the heart of downtown Toronto, Barrow, in one of the most competitive industries of hospitality, and now hit hard by COVID-19. He's worked with multi-million and billion dollar companies such as McDonald's, Verizon Wireless, and Alfa Romeo to improve their customer experience and employee engagement. Today, he'll share his insights on customer experience and employee wellness. And don't forget, and questions are welcome throughout. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you kindly, Teresa, and everyone. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention and for your time this afternoon. Um, to build a people-first culture, we must first build admired workplaces so that great people can do great work and deliver fantastic experiences to our customers so that our entire business, our brands can become admired. And I would be remiss for uh, assuming that the strategies that worked pre-COVID are going to be working today. So during our time together, I'm going to walk you through three employee wellness programs that my organization is leveraging with success today. And uh, I will put an asterisk next, next to that. And the reason that I do so is because it's worth noting that I like finding a program, building programs and finding solutions for challenges with a very cost conscious eye. I don't really like to write a check to put, get a problem um, solved. So I'm going to share some of the cost friendly strategies that uh, we're leveraging today. Uh, I'll also share some of the customer experience strategies because the experiences that we are delivering to our customers, to our guests, and to our clients may look different than when they did uh, pre-COVID. And then we will uh, go into Q&A uh, with Tony. The three wellness programs that I have found success in um, with our company first starts with doubling down or what I'm calling 2x communicating with our team members. Now, this is everyone part-time, full-time salaried employees, even extends to our vendors and our suppliers so that they are on the same page of how we are moving forward as an organization and what role they play within helping us achieve that success so that together we can have successful relationships. Uh, I was introduced to the chief people uh, officer from Cisco. And one thing that got me to double down on the communication. Uh, the, the woman's name was Fran Katsotis, and she went from hosting monthly conversations with her 76,000 employees to weekly conversations. And in studying why they did this, it's more than just staying in regular contact with your team members. It's about finding a balance between building the second wellness program and that's building your new community. Uh, we have the opportunity to make our workplaces a safe place, not just for our employees, but also for their families. How can we have conversations with our team members where it's equal part business and equal part wellness? One of the outcomes of COVID-19 is I believe that there's been a paradigm shift on how we have relationships with our customers. So that could be a positive outcome from this time that have left many of us scratching our heads. So if it's gonna be equal parts business and equal parts wellness, the business part of course is talking about our key performance indicators and how we measure success from a company level, whether it be profitability, revenue, or whichever KPIs you track. But on the wellness side, the mental health and the well-being of our team members, 
Let's make sure that we're having equal conversations on KPIs as we do these other discussion items. When we come together as a team to have these conversations, which we are now communicating more than we did before, let's laugh together. Let's invite our fam the, the family members of our employees and embrace them into the culture of our company. Some of the things that we did at our organization was we hired sleep experts in the early stages of COVID because I learned by speaking to our team members that they were having a hard time sleeping because of the stress and the anxiety of the lives that they were now living. So we reached out to sleep experts, we reached out to mental health professionals, and these are all affordable tactics. And we invited not just our employees, but also the family members and the children of our team members to come join in on the conversation. And now it's great leveraging uh, Zoom and programs like this, we're able to scale those efforts rather than bringing everybody into a room. Not only that, there was one time, I, I'm not a parent, so please excuse me, but I understood that we had employees who were parents of younger children, and of course, their lives had been turned upside down with the kids not in school or um, not currently in their summer camps. So we thought, how can we serve the parents, uh, the employees who are parents? So we host weekly uh, sessions with magicians, and we have our the kids attend these shows so that we can allow our employees who are parents to almost have a time out, maybe 30 minutes to themselves while, while our, uh, the children are being entertained. So how can we build this new community within our companies so that they're equal parts business and equal parts wellness? Lastly, talking about affordable learning tools, we it isn't a necessity anymore to always have these programs that come with a higher ticket price that don't allow us to continuously reinvest in the wellness of, pro, of, wellness of our team members. Some of the things that we've done in our organization is we actually reached out to Ma uh, the company that operates uh, Masterclass, um, an online program of uh, tutorial style videos. And we were able to negotiate a relationship with them so that our team members had access to their courses so that they could learn things from Sarah Blakely or from Howard Schultz, but they could also learn from the Gordon Ramseys and some skill sets that are completely unrelated to their job because that properly connects with the new community we're trying to build of equal parts business, equal parts wellness. We subscribed um, to some apps as well too, like Headspace or the five minute journal for our employees and Calm and an app called Sleeply so that they're able to ensure that they are reinforcing the wellness of themselves without any company involvement. The way that I see our responsibilities being going forward is we have to facilitate the wellness of our employees to ensure that they are able to maximize productivity when it comes to performing in the workplace, but never neglecting that wellness should actually come first. And I have um, found the opportunity to ensure that I am not behaving in my personal life differently than I am in my professional life. So the way that I serve my best friend, my aunt, my uncle, my mother, my father, my sister is the same way that I want to treat our team members. And that's wellness first. Moving on to our customer experience strategies. We have to understand that the definition of value and our customer journey has now changed. Customer journey mapping is a very popular exercise for companies of all sizes of all industries to perform. Have you now looked at your customer journey after COVID-19? In hospitality, in my industry, the journey has now changed. Phase two in Ontario just launched, um, is launched, uh, launched yesterday, or pardon me, today. 
And how our journey is now changing is that we have to take reservations and we can't have men we can't have menus like we used to. So these are some fundamental changes to the journey that our customers are going to be experiencing. Have you and your team taken a look at the journey map from a 20,000 foot aerial view to understand what has changed? Are your strengths still your strengths? Because that now might have changed. You may need to focus on different customer touch points to be able to serve your customers in the way that they want to be served or as close as possible. We must communicate the new experience. Customers don't like surprises, but guess what? Our customer journeys are going to be surprises to our, even to ourselves. But some of the things that you can do is properly communicate to set expectations with your customers. Perhaps that is creating some sort of content for your social media to let your customers know this is what the experience is now going to look like before they arrive or before they visit your website or however you facilitate that transaction. Perhaps you communicate via email or some other method of communication. But what we cannot do is welcome our customers to this new customer experience without prepping them in what to expect because customers do not like surprises. And learn. We have the opportunity to create a culture of learning within our organizations. But this cannot just be developed by key stakeholders or department leaders. We must include multiple layers of our company so that we can get second and third opinions on how we have to create this new experience. We have the opportunity to hit the reset button and really look at our businesses and how we are delivering great customer experiences because everything is a, there's a blank canvas. Everything's on the table. And for me, I find this time to be exciting because perhaps before COVID-19, maybe we got a little comfortable. I know I did. Maybe this is an opportunity to rethink how we deliver these great experiences to our customers. And I can tell you firsthand, the first place you must start is by going through your customer journey and identifying where do we have the opportunity to refine certain customer touch points to exceed the expectations of our customers. Now, the outcome of this is profitability, but how do you measure profitability? It isn't just dollars and cents for me. On the customer side, we want to grow organically. If you're anything like me, our marketing budgets have been decreased, so we must now go back to grassroots way of growing our businesses, and that's through referrals and repeat customers. The outcome of that is great profits and great sales, and they will come back again, I promise you this. On the employee engagement side, Having a high-performing team with that admired workplace and alignment throughout the entire organization. Thank you very much for your time and for your attention. Uh, Tony, I am going to kick it over to you uh, to facilitate the Q&A. That's a great presentation. I was doing a little bit of homework on you. I'm always fascinated with entrepreneurs, and you talk about in your story that a young kid going to work for a call center, 1-800-GOT-JUNK, which turned out to be a series of rapid promotions. But sort of your first early days in a call center where a lot of people go, how soon can I get out of here? You uncovered an insight that you feel has really transformed your business, your world, and the messages you bring into people. So I'd love it if you'd share that insight. Yes, yeah, so there was. Uh, I was a very uh, impressionable uh, twenty-two-year-old, I believe, when I joined the company, and I had some great mentors. And um, amongst the many lessons, one of the the biggest takeaway that I will look back on the earlier part of my career, and it, quite frankly, the beginning actually, is how can I focus on things that will matter to me twenty years from now. So being it earlier in my career, perhaps, you know, I was thinking earn before learn. But I think and that has to fundamentally change. You have to learn before you earn. So what mattered to me then was how am I going to build this career, which will eventually get into entrepreneurship and build a legacy for myself and saying, you know, that gentleman built a great company that whoever interacts with this organization, they really admire it. You know, he's a benevolent leader. We revere the things that he does. 
and don't get me wrong, um, I measure success by growth as well too, like some other organizations might, but I just believe that that is an outcome of having what I'm now calling the people first culture. So I like a lot of what you're saying, you know, like uh, the people first culture. And I think we are writing a new contract in so many different ways. And one of them being is, is maybe a higher purpose than just profit. But one question we had from the audience, and it really, I want to bring it back to you in the days of the call center. You, something struck you personally. How do you deal with different personalities? Let's take stress, for example, that some people like you might go, I, re- I love these days. This is about reinvention and not being complacent where a lot of other people are feeling like they're on shifting sand and they're feeling uncertain. So how do you as a leader make sure that your message is reaching both? To clarify your uh, your question, just so I'm... Um... Different people have different sense levels of stress um, and you're, build- you're bringing in these programs, you're trying to bring your organization along. How do you make sure that everybody's involved versus maybe just the high achievers? Yeah, the, the, the message I'm sharing with myself and with my team members is that there, we have an opportunity to make a, a very simple decision. We either go left or we go right. Right is the path that we're going to continue to have this anxiety and self-doubt and, and, and worry about tomorrow, or we're going to go left. And that's going to be together as an organization, we are going to acknowledge that there are going to be days where we are have high anxiety and we're very doubtful, but we're going to band together and leverage all these new systems and processes that we've built together to move forward. Because what is the alternative? going right and having high anxiety. I, I, I don't like behaving that way, whether it's pers- on a personal or a professional level and recognizing that it is okay to say that I need help. And I've been there. I've had days where I've had to reach out to my business partners and my and managers and say, I need, I need help. I, I need a sounding board. I need somebody to review the strategy for me. I'm having some, uh, some self doubt here. Uh, let's get through this together. And I know it sounds cliche, but um, it's what's working. So when you talk about your people first culture, and I can see you just listening to you as a leader. I mean, you probably know not only every employee's first name, but their significant others and their children. You're just, you're connect with people. How do we do that in this new world of Zoom and remote learning where we can knit together the culture and still have people believe (laughs) first yeah i i was actually asked a very similar question on uh, about this and what i challenge the individual and anyone is show me your calendar and i'll tell you what matters to you what i mean by that is when i speak to my management team how many times have they scheduled actual time to reach out to their team members And as the last speaker had mentioned, and actually generally reached out to their team and asked, how are you doing? And listening, listen properly. Um, So what I'm encouraging leaders of all industries uh, to do is what gets scheduled gets done. You know, don't have this sense of um, misguided sense of gratitude for your team members are actually wanting to reach out and ask them how they're doing. Make that a weekly practice. If, you know, uh, Tony, hopefully you and I uh, continue to build our friendship and our relationship, but uh, I I will tell you Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., I'm unavailable. And the reason why is because I have reserved that time to schedule for the following week which employees am I going to reach out to and ask them, how are you doing? So that's, you know, it's got to be something that is kind of built into your DNA as a leader to genuinely care about these things because, you know, right now, individuals that aren't being authentic uh, with their leaderships are probably being exposed. You know, Michelle, if I was looking at you as a speaker, I would, the way I would walk away in a file is here's somebody that's embracing things. In fact, taking it, making it happen versus wondering what happened, but doing it with a real sense of humanity, connections, making sure that everybody comes along. And I think that's the message that uh, is important for everybody. Thank you so much for, uh, for being part of it. Thank you kindly, Tony. I appreciate you. And thank you, Teresa. You know, if you're joining us right now, with the two, first two presenters we've had, Nova Nicole and, and Michelle Falcon, there's a key theme that we're, we're dealing with right now and talking about people and cultures, that desired outcome. It's not about profit anymore. It's not about how fast and how big we can grow. It's about 
getting something that's animated and desirable that people want to be part of. Even the cautious people, they have a role to play. They can come along at their pace, making sure we communicate, make sure we connect, make sure that this desired outcome is something that we all embrace. Two fantastic uh, starts, uh, Teresa. So you got a high bar to fill. I'll turn it over to you again to introduce our next uh, presenter. Thanks for capturing that, Tony. We are ready for our next presenters, and they are Hal Johnson and Joanne McLeod. Uh, we know Hal and Joanne as cultural health and fitness icons for a few decades now through their work as hosts of Body Break and more recently contestants on The Amazing Race. Uh, just last week, to contribute his voice to the building awareness of racial discrimination, Hal Johnson shared a very personal story about the origins of Body Break and how going forward, he and Joanne focused on how we can all live, work, and play together. Welcome, Hal, to start us off, and Joanne will join in. And we'll see a clip of Hal's recent statement first. Hi, I'm Hal Johnson from Body Break, and you normally see me giving you fitness and health tips and being very positive, and I'm gonna be positive now, but you think that Body Break was started because of fitness. Well, it wasn't. It was started to combat racism. That was the number one reason that we started Body Break, Joanne and I. It happened back in you know, April of 1988. And I was wanted to be a sports reporter and I went to TSN and they were very open to see me. I went in and submitted my tape. They loved it. And I got uh, hired by Jack Hutchison at 11 o'clock in the morning. And he was very enthusiastic about me joining TSN. At two o'clock that afternoon, I got a phone call and he said, uh, sorry, but, the higher up said, because I'm black and, and uh, they already had Mark Jones, who's now with the ESPN has been there for many years, because they already have a black reporter, they don't want to have two black reporters. Jack was almost in tears and he was very, very apologetic. And I was obviously very disappointed. Um, the, the next month, I then subsequently met Joanne, which was my good fortune and my good luck. And this, we started talking about doing something in television together, something fitness or something you know, uh, along those lines because Joanne's background. But uh, then on June 8th of 1988, I was doing a commercial. And that commercial was um, at Woodbine Racetrack. And there was three of us. There was myself, a white uh, young lady, and a white guy. And we were rehearsing cheering. And then after about a half hour of that, just ready before we were going to shoot, the assistant director goes to the director and, and says something. And then the director tells the white guy and white girl to switch positions. So it's myself, the white guy, and the white girls on the end. So at lunch, I then talked to the assistant director as we're in the buffet line, and I just you know, tapped him on the shoulder and I asked him, why did you switch the two of us? And he said, well, and he laughed. <laughs> he said, well, the client really didn't want you next to the white girl because, you know, and, you know, God forbid, somebody might think you're with, uh, with the white girl. And then he chuckled and laughed and then turned. and. Uh, I didn't get mad, I just thought about it. My dad had always, always told me, never get mad at something, because when you get mad, you can't find a solution to it. So that afternoon, after, after lunch, I took a piece of paper and I just wrote out kind of a storyboard, and I thought, how can I, how can I change things? How can I make that we can all live, work, and play together, and there won't be um, this attitude that, that white and black and Asian and persons with disabilities and male, female, we all can't be together. So I came up with this idea, and the idea is Body Break. Hi, everyone. Um, that was uh, the, the story uh, that we did. And boy, it's been a whirlwind of, uh, of, of a week. I've done over 60 interviews in, um, in that week's time. And it's, it's just been amazing, the response back from Canadians. And you know, when I said in there, um, people asked me, why didn't I get mad? Well. But what I didn't explain in a lot of the interviews that I did was that I'd had 31 years prior to that of, of little cuts, little things happening to me over and over and over again. So this, these instances were simply just another along those lines of things that occurred. So like, for example, when I was um, uh, in phys ed class, my phys ed teacher in grade seven, he would always say to me that I'm not very smart, so I better, you know, I better really uh, do well in athletics. Um, when I was at the University of Colorado and I was in my final year of uh, just about to graduate from the business school, I, I went on, um, they bring different corporations in and the different corporations interview you for potential jobs. Anyway, I did 11 uh, interviews. Uh, I did 10 second interviews and I received seven job offers. 
in every single interview, the male interviewer asked me, he said, or he would say to me, you know, you're very smart. Like you, you speak very well. You're very articulate. And I would know that this is going to come. I know. And I would say to myself, he's not asking that of the white guy. He's not saying that to the white guy, boy, you're, you've gone through four and a half years of university and you're, you've been able to attain this and you, you can speak well. And so those are the things that you get over the years as a, as a, as a minority, as a black person in North America, much more in the United States um, than here in Canada, but in Canada, it's much more subtle. <clears throat> and nowadays they, they call it systemic racism. Um, and I didn't think of it in those terms as called systemic racism. I just knew that, that this was, let's try to shake it up a bit with body break. So when we thought of body break, we thought, well, how can we, how can we make this the new normal? Because systemic really means here's what's normal and let's shake it up a little bit. So let's show that male, female in reverse roles, let's show persons with disabilities. Let's, Let's show that, and, and if you look at our body break episodes back throughout the years, we always have some person of color or somebody doing something, uh, a person doing sign language over the shoulder in the background. That was, that was very strategic and that we are trying to do that. We're trying to show that person at home, that five-year-old kid at home, that it, this is normal. This is the normal, that we all can be together uh, as one. And, and it was, um, and what was interesting is when, when I, a lot of the interviews I was getting this week was they were saying, I can't believe that those were from the white interviewers. I never got that from black interviewers. Black interviewers would never say, I can't believe because they can believe because it happens every day. And the parallels between what the women go through uh, in terms of their day to day in dealings in business and, and in life are very similar to that of a, a, a minority, a person of color. I feel a lot of parallels between the two uh, over the years. You know, I look into to boardrooms that I've gone into. I've gone into hundreds of boardrooms, rarely seen uh, a person of color in an ad agency or a PR agency, rarely um, making decisions. So, so how can people who are promoting something going to be able to put, uh, if they don't have a, a a, a pantone of colors of people in that room, person with disability in, in as far as promotion is concerned and advertising to the Canadian public. I've always wondered that. And so it's really, when we created Body Break, it was about that. And we've got a Body Break episode I'd like you to see. It might bring back the music a little bit as well. And uh, what I'd like you to do is look at the first about 12, 15 seconds, see if you can spot what we did that, that may have kind of tricked the audience just a little bit. Uh, and so let's take a look at that uh, video. Body Break with Hal Johnson and Joanne McLeod. When watching friends play, we can often spot problems that can help prevent injuries and improve their game. Jo, for example, well, she has a little trouble with her backhand. Well, playing tennis or any racket sport may cause tennis elbow, which is swelling around the joint. One way to prevent this is to stretch your arms before you play. Form an L at your wrist by raising your hands and fingers parallel with the ground. Maintain this L position for a count of five. Hold your arms straight and don't bend your elbows. Now turn your hands inwards, causing your fingers to point to your thighs. Hold and count to five. Next, in one fluid motion, rotate your hands in the opposite direction as far back as you can comfortably and hold in this position for five seconds. Another way to prevent tennis elbow is to hit the ball with your arms slightly bent. And the proper racket can also help. So when looking for a new racket, make sure it fits your hand, strength, and ability. You're served. So until next time, keep fit and have fun. Body break. Well, uh, I hope uh, you, you were able to detect what we did in the first, uh, first 10 seconds or so. What we did is we didn't show the chair. We, we led with, you didn't know who Joanne was playing against. You didn't know that that person was in a wheelchair. And that was, as I say, strategic because we want to show 
that's not the most important part. But people that are in wheelchairs are going to see that and they're going to feel part of the community. So that was our, our goal and our focus. And it was, it was interesting because uh, Joanne and I, what we also did at um, uh, the spinal, spinal cord, uh, cord was a, a part of Sunnybrook. We went and did wheelchair basketball there. And it was interesting what Joanne said to me. She said, when, when we were both in the chairs, she didn't see the chair, she saw me. And I think that's one of the things we, we, we tried to get to is that you don't see the disability. You don't see the, the color of people, the differences. We just see them as people. And that's what we've you know, strived to do over all these years. But you know, part of the other video that, that I put out was that um, at, I went to 42 different companies and I got turned down by every one. And it was like, I'd come back and I'd tell Joanne, yeah, they turned us down and I'd be excited. And she said, well, why is it excited about that? I said, well, they've never seen anything like that before. And I, I took that as such a positive that eventually it's gonna happen and we're, and we're gonna we're gonna make it and it's gonna it's gonna go. And and that positivity really came from my mom and dad. Um, my, my mom and dad really just always told me that, you know, I was the greatest, I could do that. And and they're uh, they're 88 and 86 years old right now, and and they're just um, they're still positive as as they've ever been. And they they uh, they they're secluded with the COVID, but they're uh, they're very positive. And and my parents would always tell me they say you can do anything that you strive to do, and they were so supportive of me. And when I um, when I was eight when I was eight years old, my grandmother, my Irish grandmother, gave me this poem. And this poem, she said to me, she said, you're going to have such a hard time in life. You're going to be, your life is going to be so difficult for you. I want you to read this poem every single day. And as perhaps you can see on it, it's got all kinds of stains and, and so forth. I had it. And I read it every day when I was uh, a little kid at, at home. I had it punched into the wall. I, I went to college. I had it. Um, and I had it uh, and framed it on my first job. I had it. I was there and I read it. It's called, it's called The Man Who Thinks He Can. If you think you're beaten, you are. If you think you're not, you don't. If you like to win but think you can't, it's almost a cinch that you won't. If you think you'll lose, you're lost. For out in the world you'll find, success begins with one's will. It's all in the state of mind. If you think you're outclassed, you are. You've got to think high to rise. You've got to be sure of yourself before you can win that prize. Because you see, life's battles don't always go to the strongest or fastest one. But sooner or later, the one who wins is the one who thinks they can. So that was the uh, poem that I uh, was given a, a, by my grandmother. It was such an inspiration. And I still, whenever I feel down, I feel I can't do it, I go back to the poem. But, uh, and then, hey, 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 oh, look she's, with the, the uh, same, oh, track suit. the same thing. <laughs> I have to admit, we don't in our day-to-day -day life actually no, dress no, alike. No. That would just be silly. No, right? well, we're, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've been fortunate enough over the last 32 years to encourage Canadians to really build strong, healthy bodies because it impacts almost everything in your life. You know, we've seen over the last months of, about COVID-19 and uh, your body and your mind is so important to be uh, strong. You know, several years ago, we had a chance to be on season one of The Amazing Race. And we walked away from that feeling that it's a metaphor for life, the race. You know, we all have challenges. We all get rewards. We all uh, face roadblocks and we get you turned in life right yeah, that dreaded u-turn and it stops you in your tracks but with you know positive uh, physical and mental strategies you really can turn that u-turn around as we know we were uh, we had to definitely put those strategies into play you know over the last few weeks um, we've been really happy that Canadians have learned more about the body break story and we plan on continuing to encourage Canadians to get and be as committed as possible to live healthy active lifestyles and in turn uh, work live and play together yeah. and until next time keep, keep it and have, have fun, fun. Oh. Now you're going to tell me that you've confused me because Hal, I was booking you because I think you're an uh, you're it's such an incredible story. Now the two of you I want, so I don't know which <laughs> way to begin. But I'm going to start with you because it, is it possible that as you 
think of your legacy in life because it was clearly bringing health and wellness to Canadians, but you might have a higher purpose here now because by the way you're personalizing the stories and talking about the poem from your Irish grandmother and, and what your parents taught you, that you're, that's a message that I think everybody in this country needs to not only deal with racism, but just deal with this whole sense of how we can do things together. It, uh, absolutely, it, it is, and it, it's it's like I do feel it's we're on a, another journey, and I think it's. I said to Joanne, I said if I had have passed away and we had never said this, it, it would have been still a great life. But I think there's something more to get this message out. And the biggest thing I feel right now is people are listening. People want to listen. They want to do something. They realize it's important. And uh, you know, we just started 32 years ago, but they're catching up. You know, one of the things my grandmother, my Irish grandmother, she was uh, embarrassed having black um, and brown uh, grandchildren. She loved us, but she was embarrassed to have us around. So when she had Alzheimer's, when she was 88 years old, my mom would go every week, and my sister and my picture would be in the dresser drawer. My mom would put take it out, put it back on the dresser, and every week the the, the pictures would be back in, and all the other white grandchildren would be would be on the dresser drawer it's it is simply that those are the things you have to deal with those are things my parents had to deal with so what i have to deal with now and what joanna and I have to deal with is minuscule comparatively to what they had to deal with so uh trying to you know it's uh and so i take a lot of uh, warmth and comfort from them so when i talk to both of you and, and we're dealing in a world now where you were a lot about physical health not that it didn't touch the mental health but I see a world now with so much mental health issues happening in terms of where do we stand, what's going next. How are you going to bring your message to, so when we bring you in a meeting or a conference, does it extend beyond the physical to the mental and also these messages about almost the emotional? Oh, most definitely. You know, the mental aspect, if you're, if you're not feeling um, good about yourself, it's very difficult to do anything physically. So by addressing the emotional of, of, of saying, okay, what is it that, that is uh, affecting you? What are the, some of the strategies that you can use to move forward, to, to feel better? And part of that is the exercise aspect of it. And because that also impacts on, well, your, your self-esteem, how you, how you relate to others, how you're getting um, a good night's sleep, all of those types of things come into play. So it, they're, you know, the, the mental health important, but they're all interrelated. So I want to just end by Hal saying that uh, that might have been the nursing home years ago, but up in heaven right now, your Irish grandmother's learning down your pictures. From the <laughs> Let me say something to you. My mom said, my mom said to me last week, this, she said, I wish my parents, she wishes her parents were alive today to see her grandchildren. That was very, very touching. I believe they look down at you and they're looking and smiling and going, wow, this guy, this person and you two made us proud, made Canada proud. Thank you so much for being part of this today. Thank I can't you. wait to see you out in the uh, convention floors and I'll turn it back to you, Tracy. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Helen, Joanne. Uh, really inspiring and some good fun there too. So much appreciated. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Kim Katrin. She's co-founder of the People Project, an activist for justice and inclusion, a mother, an educator, and an LGBTQ advocate seen worldwide as one of the faces of the Gap Pride campaign. Kim Katrin is dedicated to inclusivity, invested in arousing curiosity, and being inspiring in her approach to solutions. By focusing on small, meaningful actions and choices, she makes creating large-scale change accessible. Today, she'll address education to action, how your organization can act with integrity against anti-Black racism. Welcome, Kim. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's really so inspiring to be a part of a lineup like this and to get to hear Hal Johnson speak too, I think really builds upon a lot of the energy that I really want to have um, as a part of this. Because I think one of the points that he made that was really crucial is, you know, when we get angry at something, we stop listening and we stop being open. And I think when we start to talk about racism, and I've been talking about racism and equity issues you know, for over 10 years, that it can put up this wall for people where they feel afraid or ashamed or guilty. And I just want to share that none of those things end up being really useful or valuable. And if we recognize that we have power 
then that means that we have the ability to do something about it. That means we have the capacity to create transformative change. And this moment is really one of those once in a lifetime, once in all of our lifetime moments where there's an incredible energy and critical mass. It gives us the capacity to create an enormous amount of change right now. And I want to really focus on some of the tangible steps that companies and organizations can take when they really want to begin that journey. Because I think that, again, what we're seeing right now is if you're not being authentic, if you're not actually having a real commitment in these ways, we're all very critical because of the ways that people are on social media right now that companies won't actually be able to retain the relationship that they have with their, their clients, their communities, and their employers. So I'm going to get into our Prezi. I like to work with Prezi's because they are public and shareable and free and end up being really accessible in terms of the way that we can have these conversations. So the first place I would start is simply by saying that you want to begin with a plan and make sure that it's informed. Once you as a company or an organization have decided that you want to begin on this process of creating more change or of working in a more anti-racist way or of expressing kind of solidarity, we've seen a lot of emails come out from different companies. You want to be able to begin that process with a clear plan and a clear trajectory of where you want to go and make it informed. Look at other people who are also in your in your peer group who are also doing that, other companies that are also moving in that way, and do that first kind of process of research just to get a sense of how you should be moving. The next step is really around mapping your employer's history with anti-oppression and anti-racism education. And this is important because I think this has happened for a lot of people where they've been engaged in processes or there's been a one-off workshop here or there, but it hasn't actually turned into anything. So you don't want to come into a place and feel like you have all the solutions when in fact it's happened before or it's happened in a way that wasn't genuine. So really map out an entire history of how your company has approached it in the past and ensure you're talking to key stakeholders, that you're talking to people who are most meaningfully impacted by it in ways that make it clear that there won't be any social or economic penalty that comes with sharing their perspectives on what has happened in the history of that company. Knowing the definition of what equity looks like, of what inclusion looks like in your workplace, and watching how quickly we're seeing that change. So just recently, we saw that the Associated Press changed its writing style guide on June 19th to capitalize the B in Black, which is something that I think most educators have actually been doing for a very long time. But it's now done this to be consistent with longstanding identifiers like Latino and Asian American and Native American. And now they're also going to be capitalizing indigenous, which is really significant in terms of how we recognize that language really shapes a lot of this discourse. If we don't have the ability to have a shared language or a shared capacity for conversation around this, then we're really not able to move it forward. I talk about this a lot. A problem that we can't talk about is one that we can't do anything about. And embedded in a lot of our language are so many different ways in which people are made to seem smaller, are made to seem less valuable. And one of the most basic ways is by going through those definitions that exist in the workplace or that exist in your fields, making those things really clear and making sure that you're actually in consistency, acting in a way that's consistent with what other people in the industry are doing, or even taking it another level. How can you be ahead of the curve? So in this case, companies that have already been doing this, have already been working in this way, have already been capitalizing the B in Black and the I in Indigenous, are already setting a tone for what their integrity has looked like. So it's not, I wouldn't say that it's enough to just meet the bar, we really do want to think about how we're exceeding and we're excelling because we're pushing forward. And I think this is de definitely one of those moments in time where we either let go or we're going to be dragged. So we either let go of the way that things have happened and things have worked. I think even, you know, this time of COVID-19 is also about that. We can hold on tightly to the things that we have engaged with in the past, or we can embrace what's coming. We can be open to what's happening and actually use this information that is now accessible to us to move in a way that, again, is setting a precedent and is going to leave a legacy that is really meaningful going forward. 
The next piece is finding out national and local human rights laws. And this is a good place to start when we want to first understand like what are our legal requirements as a company or as an organization, but also what are the legal limitations that black folks and indigenous folks and people of color are facing? Are they, are they able to be protected by the laws that are in your current area? And if they are not, are there places where you as a company can actually be a part of that fight? Can you advocate in different ways around what the laws are to make sure that people are even more protected? Or can you extend a kind of protection over your employees that, again, makes you a more valuable place for people to be? So if everyone else is working in a way that isn't offering the kind of protection that you are able to offer for your employees, and you can do that, then that, again, makes you a place that will be a home to so many incredibly innovative and really resourceful people of color, Black folks, Indigenous folks, to want to come to where you are. This is also a good opportunity to identify metrics. Identify what your numbers are. If you recognize that you have a certain percentage of people on your staff and you want to increase that number and you want to say you want to get to 50%, you want to get to 30%, you want to increase by 10% every single year, then this is the time to really start identifying what metrics you can use because absolutely racism can happen in ways that are anecdotal. Um, I think that a lot of people have described, I was actually reading an, an, an article by a manager who described that he had managed 20 people over the course of his time at this company, two of whom were black. And while no one ever explicitly said anything negative to those black people or made any racial slurs, he found that every time they called in sick, they were always being doubly questioned by upper management. People were always asking, are you sure they're really sick or there's really a reason for them to do that? If there was ever a moment where they weren't present at their desks, there were always substantially more questions. So he noticed that in comparison to all the other 18 staff that he would manage, that these two in particular were more highly scrutinized. And so, yes, it's true that so many of the things that happened around racism are these microaggressions or these more anecdotal experiences. And so those may be more difficult to capture when we think about metrics and we think about quantitative solutions, but we need to do both. It's not an either and an or. It's a making space for those anecdotal growth to happen as well as it is about having clear, tangible, quantitative markers that help us achieve very clear goals. So thinking about, again, the laws that change a culture, we see how very recently that the Supreme Court has actually blocked Trump from ending DACA, which is really great for dreamers. We've seen even more laws recently pushed forward because of Brianna and because of so many of the other kinds of violence that we've seen in the past little bit. So recognizing that there has been a very big shift to laws as a result of what's happening is a really good opportunity for everyone to go and really understand what the legal context that we're operating in is. And as I mentioned before, to head for metrics. So understanding this is from Alberta, and this is talking about how we design effective pay equity laws for Alberta and thinking about how, again, as companies, if we know that maybe the law hasn't had its teeth yet, and it hasn't had the capacity to enforce in the ways that you know would meaningfully affect your team and meaningfully protect Black, Indigenous, and people of color who are part of your team, then take that initiative and take that to set that precedent of how things could be as opposed to waiting for things to catch up. Get familiar with the why. Get familiar with all of the research out there because as you begin any anti-racism work in any kind of employment situation, there's always going to be a pushback. And having a conversation with people is going to be integral for this being able to work. Again, we have to be able to talk about these things. People have to be able to express what's coming up for them so that we can address it. And when you become familiar with the why, when you become familiar with all of the research that already exists, then it means that you're ready to answer those questions. And then the other piece on that is make that information accessible and make it visible. So making sure that when you're sharing all that information and you're reading it and you're consuming it as a manager, that you're making sure these things are accessible and visible to all of the staff members. So much of what happens when we talk about anti-racism initiatives is it gets siloed into a very specific conversation that happens on a very specific day with usually one particular person. And what you really are trying to do is open that up. 
making it something that is really a part of the culture in an organization and in a company so that it shifts the culture really from the basics. A big part of this is that we found that although, and this is from interviewing 1.2 million PhD, um, PhD havers, holders, sorry, um, that they found that people of color introduced more innovative ideas but are not recognized as rapidly when compared to their white male peers. And so this is something I talk about so often when I'm especially working and consulting with tech companies is that people of color, black folks, indigenous folks are actually coming with some of the most innovative perspectives because they are coming often from outside of conventional institutions or have a different perspective from what the dominant discourse tends to be. And despite coming with more innovative solutions, these solutions are less likely to be implemented, and if they are, they happen a lot slower, and usually they only happen when they're co-signed by another white male peer. And so part of what's happening here is when we are maintaining these very racist structural values, we're preventing the innovation and the growth and the betterment of our companies. We're preventing these spaces from actually thriving in the ways that they could be. So on a really bottom line level, this isn't just about how it is a feel good experience, but it's also about how it genuinely transforms companies for the best. Lastly, or so coming down to the end is invest money, time and opportunity. Act with urgency. You know, we value things that cost money and we don't negotiate on fixed goods. We would never go into the Apple store and say, okay, instead of me charging, you charging me $3,000, I would love if I could give you 250 and you give me that laptop. So similarly, when it comes to putting energy behind these initiatives, you wanna invest tangibly money, tangibly resources, hire experts. And we've seen in the past little bit, we saw how Ben Mulroney stepped down. We saw how Alexis uh, stepped down from the head of Reddit to say that they wanted to make more space for people of color, for black folks to take on those roles. Do something that is tangible and meaningful and creates more opportunities in a really real way because we definitely want to move in a way that is substantial. Assess cultural climate. This is significant. Obviously we want to take, a, take stock of what's happening and we want to understand that whatever we're seeing, whatever racism we can identify is literally only the tip of the iceberg. You know, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. If we don't see that experience, it doesn't mean it's not there. Sometimes they lack the language or lack anonymous spaces where those things can actually be discussed. And a lot of the time we have this idea or this perspective that Canada is this just bastion where racist ideas aren't happening. But this was an analysis that was done, one of the largest of its kind, that found that 11 million people worldwide are reached the number of global online users are reached by more than 6,600 right-wing social extreme groups in Canada. So this is coming from Canada, from 6,600 groups on social media are reaching 11 million people globally, that Canada is actually a home to an enormous amount of really white supremacist perspectives and values. And so we have to be, again, willing to face these things, to have these meaningful conversations, so that we can do something about it. Because this idea that we're pretending that these things are not issues is really part of what's actually causing that damage. And finally, create a new and permanent system. So create a real feedback loop within your company and your organization that means that change is constant, innovation is constant. You start from a place of acclimatizing yourself, understanding what's going on, you implement solutions, you create that change tangibly, you review it, you see how it's working, you collect anonymous feedback so people don't feel like their job is at risk when they're telling the truth about what they're experiencing. You excel, you set the standard, you raise the bar, you keep going higher, higher and higher in order to create an even more welcoming environment for the people who are part of your team and to set again a precedent that allows you to be an industry leader and you sustain. You sustain that growth, you keep going and you keep moving in that process and that is really how we create that change and sustain that change going forward. So thank you so much. Kim, that was, uh, that was an, I mean, I was just, I was doing a lot of reading on some of the work you're doing and it's, I can't, I just, I'm not maybe a personal thing, but you've done so much to tackle social injustice and, and at quite an early age. 
Give me a sense of what your proudest moment is where you know that the work you're doing. Sorry, she's, she's a ticket. I would say, in general, I feel really lucky to have a lot of proud moments. I really love the opportunity to be working with people and watch their minds change. And it's always a very significant time where you see people who maybe come in and, you know, their body language is clear, like their arms are crossed, they're not interested, they're not invested. But the more and more we have a conversation, the more and more you see their body language start to open up. And then you'll slowly start to see like a head nod. And you just watch that it is, it's a true experience that happens all the time that people have a set of values. And when presented with new, compelling information, shift that set of values to be more open and more inclusive and more equitable. And I think that a lot of the time we're sold this idea that this kind of change doesn't happen and we won't see it in our lifetime. And so every time I have that moment, it makes me feel just really proud to know that it does happen and it happens way more often than we're told. First of all, just so, so we can see your body language, take your, uh, your share screen off so we can go full oh, frame. Yes. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, the, the next question I have for you is that you wrote this incredible thing that rather than assuming the way you want to be treated as a standard for all, Kim encourages audiences to treat people the way they want to be treated, which means we have to ask and listen. Why is it so hard for people to ask and listen? I think that a lot of the time we are made to feel ashamed for not knowing everything or, you know, especially when we are in school, there's a penalty when we don't know the right answer. And we have this association that making a mistake or not knowing everything or coming into a situation and not being completely knowledgeable is somehow us being at a deficit as opposed to something that we actually all share in. We don't know what other people need. And we really don't know that even in our personal relationships until we ask. And a lot of the time, even in our closest relationships, we make the assumption that people know what we need just because that's how we feel. And we assume that we are all the standard. We assume that our own personal experience is the same experience that everyone else is having. So I think that when we do get to ask people, you know, what do you need and how would you like to be treated, we really open up and we challenge this idea that there is this standard of what normalcy looks like. And we allow each other to co-create something that can meaningfully serve everyone. You know, we keep going back to that same theme of this desired outcome and doing it together. I've got a final question for you, and it kind of builds on what you just said, because I know you're very compelling in terms of how you present your arguments on a conference stage or via a Zoom conference. What do people say to you after you get off the stage? Because I always measure a speaker by the kind of huddle that happens at the coffee break, and their eyes are shining. So tell me a couple of examples of what, how people would feel and think and do after they had the honor of listening to you. Yeah, I, I really get, I mean, I think like pre-COVID times, I would definitely get a lot of hugs, a lot of really emotional responses. You know, people often feel heard and seen in a way that they have often never experienced in conference spaces. Or people who have felt challenged, they don't feel as though they're not valuable. You know, to challenge someone and to still feel like I'm needed and I have something to do and I have something to bring. Because I think that Sometimes when people feel challenged, they can feel like maybe they're obsolete or they're no longer connected to the people who are around them. But I get this really incredible emotive sense from people. People want to tell me their own life stories, their own experiences, how they felt moved and how they want to go on and really take that. I get a lot of people also who tell me that now they feel catalyzed. Now they're like, okay, I feel really convicted, you've really given me the kind of encouragement that I need. And now I'm going to take this information and go out and seek more and go create that work in my community. I talk about this a lot. You know, the grass is greenest where you water it, that we create the most powerful change in the places where we nurture it, the places that we know. So really watching people the moment I get off stage feel so excited to go back to the places that they're from and to share the message and to go and create change is always just incredibly inspiring. Kim, I'm sending you a virtual hug. Uh, I can't wait to post COVID's over because I can just imagine how magical it is to see those people coming out and feeling that they belong and they're part of something and, and that we're all in it together. So thank you for joining us. It's, it's been terrific. Thank you so much for having me. You know, it's an interesting thing as we're listening to this, how important personal stories are 
to communicating, how important it is to people to, to draw upon their, what's happened to them. The Irish grandmother was handing the poem over, you know, and people walking in organizations or how they felt and using that as, as a way to communicate and evoke change. And I think that's a big part of what we're listening to today is that desired outcomes out there, but people have to personalize it to make it work. We've got one more presenter. We can't wait to introduce them for that. Turn it back to Teresa. Thanks, Tony. Indeed, our final speaker is Orlando Bowen today. Orlando is founder of One Voice, One Team. He's a former CFL linebacker and someone who survived a personal experience with police brutality. He's taken such challenging experiences in his life and become a game changer and a messenger of hope who inspires change with his words and delivers results with his actions. He'll bring us together today with One Voice, One Team, building resilience and creating change through collaboration. Welcome, Orlando. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's, uh, it's been amazing to be able to uh, bask in the presence of, of the presenters that have gone uh, thus far. I'm, I'm so excited to have this time. I want to send a quick shout out to our peeps out in Green Bay. I got a, a, a short text or a text a short while ago saying, go get them. Right. So right back at you. Appreciate you so much. Um, you know, life is all about perspective. And uh, I remember... Um, you know, a, a quote that, that my, uh, my grandmother used to say, and she had many of them, right? And as we heard, we heard, you know, Hal and Joanne, they were talking about perspective and about, you know, Hal's grandmother. Uh, Kim was just on. She was giving us a number of nuggets in terms of actionable items. And she, she raised something that was, that was very powerful in, in terms of the notion of raising the bar, right? And my grandmother used to always say, you know, raise the bar, and as you raise the bar, make sure that you raise the floor too so that more people can reach the bar. Because it's never about you as an individual, it's always about us. And that's the collective us. Raise the bar, raise the floor. I've had a chance to do a lot of different, you know, like fun and interesting things. I've, you know, played professional football. I've done some, a little bit of acting. I've worked with professional athletes. I serve with high performance corporate folk now and also run a youth leadership charity. And uh, one of the most uh, powerful experiences that I've had in terms of just engaging in, in conversation was when a friend of mine, now I want you to think of, think of a friend who, you know, they could call you at 1 a.m. or 6 a.m. and you'd happily answer the phone. A friend that if you're in need, they'd be like, I got your back, Tony, I'm here for you, right? So, someone like that, think of that type of an individual, right? So I have a friend like that that invited me um, to go speak with her somewhere. She was about to speak to a group of, uh, of, of, young, of young men. And she says, Orlando, would you do me the honor of coming with me and speaking to this group? And I, without hesitation, because of the type of person she is, I said, absolutely, I'm there. What time, what's the place? And she said, um, you're going to need to uh, bring some government issued ID because um, it's a maximum security prison. So I said, oh, okay, cool. And in my head, I thought, that's why you ask questions. Um, ahead of time. So, but anyhow, because of the type of person she is, I'm like, all right, let's go, let's do this. So I bring my government issued ID. We go and I'm speaking in this maximum security prison. Uh, she has a chance to share, then I have an opportunity to share. And as I as I wrap up my, my conversation with, with those uh, residing in, in the correction facility, I see a young man, he's seated at the back and he's, he's rubbing his chin. It's almost it's like he's in deep thought, right? So he's sitting at the back and he's rubbing his chin. And because we had spoken about some deep and what I consider important things, it wasn't surprising that someone may be in deep thought. So as I see him rubbing his chin, I said, hey man, how you doing? Are you good? But he didn't respond. He just sat there rubbing his chin. So I, I began to pack my things up and I figured I'd just leave him and, and let him do his thing. And as I'm packing my things up, I feel his eyes and his presence start to move. And the young man got up and he started pacing. He started to pace and he was rubbing his chin. He started to pace and he was rubbing his face. He started to pace and then he began to rub his forehead. And then he walked over to a table that was in the middle of the room. He slammed on the table and he looked at me and he said, where were you? I didn't know there was another path. And I will always remember that moment because the power with which the emotion with which he asked that question, where were you? Will always sit heavy on my heart. And then the statement that followed, I didn't know there was another path. 
there's a lot that's happening in our world right now. There's a lot in terms of the, the emotional engagement that people are going through, maybe your staff are going through, maybe you yourself are, are experiencing right now. And there's a lot of uncertainty, what's gonna happen next. And, and, and the reality is we don't have control over all the things that will happen next, but we have control over what we do with this time that we have, what we do with the energy that we have, what we do with the connections, the people around us, how we celebrate and honor and validate them can preemptively answer that question, where were you? I remember, you know, being at a time in my life where everything from the outside looking in, you know, probably looked super amazing, right? I was uh, playing professional football. I was married to a hottie, still am. Uh, we were, we, we had uh, an 18 month old son and she was pregnant with our second and, and everything was awesome indeed, right? Lots to be grateful for. And I was about to sign a contract extension uh, with the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the Canadian Football League. So I was excited too, right? I'm about to do this day. My, uh, my father-in-law happens to be a legend in the sport of football in Hamilton and in the state of Ohio um, for being an undefeated quarterback from high school all the way through the end of his college career and then uh, won the Grey Cup as a rookie quarterback with the Hamilton Tiger Cats. His name's Chuck Ealy. Um, so so this, this legacy, this connection to the Tiger Cats was something I was excited about, our family was excited about. So I go out uh, and we, I sign the contract extension and decide to go celebrate with some of my teammates. I get the, to the, the meetup location first and we're gonna carpool and then head downtown Toronto. I get to the carpool location. I'm waiting for my friends and teammates to arrive and I look over, I see two guys walking towards me and one guy says, hey man, what you got? Got any drugs? And I'm looking at him, I was on the phone at the time. I said, no. I go back to my phone call. Well, one guy kept walking, the other guy walked to the back of my vehicle and he stopped and he looked at me and said, are you sure? And I was about to answer him but then I recall that when I had first seen them, when the question was first posed, I remember seeing two guys. And now I'm only seeing one, so I'm wondering, where's the other guy? So as I look over in, in my blind spot, I notice that the other guy is standing out of sight, right? So I step back so I could see them both at the same time. I said, what's going on? And, and uh, to make a long story short, these guys were both armed with guns. Um, there were two corrupt undercover, two plainclothes Police officers, they end up grabbing me and, and start trying to wrestle me down to the ground. And I'm saying, oh my gosh, what did I do? I didn't do anything. And the fists were flailing and they're trying to get my, my leg to collapse. And I'm saying, I didn't do anything. Oh my goodness. And there was this moment. Now, I want you to think about this. This was probably, I was probably the most athletic that I had been in my life. Six foot two, 235 pounds, bench pressing about 450 pounds, squatting about 600 pounds and running pretty fast. Right, so as, as they're trying to get me to the ground, the, you could imagine the adrenaline is starting to flow through my body now. And, and as one of them grabbed my arm and tried to put it behind my back, I pulled my arm away and I said, what's going on? And when I pulled my arm away, the gentleman flew about 10 feet. And when he gathered himself, he put his hand on his pistol and he turned to his partner and he, he said, I'm gonna shoot him in the head, I swear to God. And in that moment, I realized that if I establish any semblance of an upper hand, I wouldn't live to see my family again. And I knew that I was, in order for me to make it home, I was gonna have to let them take me down and just protect my skull and protect my organs. So as they took me down, the, the, the beatings continued and they beat me and they beat me until the skin on my head split and I was face down on the pavement. And all I could think was, God, not like this. Don't let me die like this. I got so much in me to give, man, not like this. At the time of the assault, I was very involved in community. I was training police in racial sensitivity. I was doing a lot of outreach. I was working with sick youth, homeless youth, refugee families, newcomer families. I was doing all that I could to serve and give back. That was the whole notion of raising the bar, but also raising the floor. So when the assault happened, and when the gentleman that I was assaulted by, I realized that I was actually the spokesperson for their service, the spokesperson that bridged community and police that brought them together. I was scheduled to be the keynote at a, an event called the Race Against Racism that would bring police and community together. When they realized that, a huge cover-up began. When I was taken to prison, I wasn't allowed to speak to anyone. I was denied medical attention and denied any opportunity for a phone call. And while I was in there, you know, a gentleman came up 
to my jail cell and he looked at me and uh, he, he, he looks at me and my face was beaten and, and, and bloodied and he says, hey man, um, do you have any diseases? Because your blood, it got on a couple of our guys. Should we test them for some disease you might have? And I looked at them thinking, human being to human being, are, are you serious? That's what you're asking me? I said, no, I, I, I don't have any disease. And he said, okay, good, and he walked off. Hours passed and, and then I was advised that I was being charged. So I said, charged with what? You, you're being charged with two counts of assaulting a police officer and one count of possession of a controlled substance was what I was told. Then I realized as they opened my jail cell up, I kept thinking, well, they're, they're going to, you know, they're going to realize that I'm, I'm like working to, with the police to bridge community and police, right? They're going to, I work with so many amazing officers leading up to this point, and I still do to this day. I knew that what, someone was going to stand up and say, hey, we made a mistake. We need to fix this until, until no one did. The charges were for real. And I remember being handcuffed and taken to court the next morning while I sat in the courtroom, an officer came in, he took his hand, put his hand on the Bible, took an oath to tell the truth. He looked at me and he looked at the judge and he said, Your Honor, he's six foot two, 235 pounds, and he's actually trained to hurt people. In my 17 years, I've never been so afraid for my life or my partner's life. And he looked at me and smiled. When our eyes met, all I could think was, right, my grandmother's words again that would always say hurt people, hurt other people. And all I could think was what kind of pain must he have been through to, to allow him the capacity to do that to another human being? And in that moment, I, I, I felt this deep sorrow for him. And I did, you know, our family is a family of faith. I started to pray for him to get the help that he needed and for the truth to come out. Now, what some would consider to be a strange turn or a twist of events, we got six weeks before the verdict. And I got a call from, from a, a news reporter that advised me that the arresting officer in my case was himself arrested for trafficking cocaine. He found 17 kilos of cocaine at his house, right? So this, this crazy journey, he was arrested, charged. He ended up being convicted. I was acquitted. We filed a civil lawsuit that settled out of court. All in all, it took about five and a half years for the process for us. So when, when um, George Floyd was on the ground. People asked me, Orlando, when you saw that, what, how did that make you feel? What did you, what, what emotions came up for you? And, and it, for me, it was, was very simple. When I saw, that was me. That was me on the ground. I know what that feels like. And there was a stark contrast between th that, that experience. When I, I went to a couple of, of, of of marches that some of the young people whom we've worked with were putting on and people were walking and chanting black lives matter. And there was, there were white people and black people and brown people and everything in between and the emotion, the passion was there. And all I could think was what a powerful juxtaposition between this moment with all these people chanting and dying on the pavement by yourself. With all this happening, family, we have an opportunity. As painful as it is, as challenging as it is, we have an opportunity to use the energy, to use the emotion, to use those challenges, to chart a new path, to chart a path of possibilities by how we decide to show up, by how we journey through this challenge. I, I you know, it was a difficult time. I ended up, I wrote a letter of gratitude to the officers. It's now, you know, referred to as a letter of forgiveness where I, I let them know that I thank them for the experience and the perspective that I gained. And when I hug my kids, when I hug my wife, I hug them tight and tell them that I love them. And it's not that I was taking anything for granted before, but the perspective that I've gained helps me understand how precious life is, how precious the this time we have is, and how precious the decisions that we make with this moment is. We have an opportunity to get better and not just to go through this, but to grow through it, but it takes all of us. So when I say one voice with energy and passion, I know you're muted. I know you, I can't hear you, but it doesn't matter. When I say one voice with passion and energy, I want you to say one team, one voice, one voice. That's what it takes. We're in this thing together. It's the only way we're gonna be able to journey through it. Part of the reason why my life didn't end that night was because we, we needed to have this conversation today. Thank you, honored by your presence and your time. I look forward to having the opportunity to serve alongside you. Thank you. Orlando, um, if you could see everybody, you'd be getting a standing ovation. That was an incredible, 
uh, honest, authentic, real, and uh, you have such a great higher purpose on this planet. I'm glad you didn't die that night because uh, that, your message should go everywhere. And uh, how, how do you... How do you how do you determine what's next for you? Because I see a thousand doors that you should be going through, sh shouting one voice. How, how do you, what, what's next for you? What are we going to see when we follow you over the next twenty five years? Well, I, I think you know an opportunity to really connect with people who share what you've just articulated, right? The 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 fact that this challenge is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to step in to chart a new path. Right for the first time in my life, and I never anticipated a time that I would live to experience where people would be open to sit to looking at what's it like to be black in Canada, to be African American. What is what does that look like, sound like, feel like? What are the conversations that you you have with your kids that other people don't have to have? Right. So I feel as though like organizations, companies, teams that are ready to take another step towards possibilities my arms are open and saying, let's do it together. Let's go, because that's how we get to it. One of the things that I think is so powerful of what you said was that every time you hug your, your children, you hug your wife, you say, I love you, it, it matters most because you, take, you, 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 you took that moment and you realized how special life was. And I'm hoping that maybe through COVID-19, people like you can go to people and say, yeah, it's, it's not all great, but there's a moment in time that we can we can learn from and maybe live the way that you live every day where every hug matters. It's, it's, it's just wonderful. And uh, mm -hmm. listen, we, we're so honored to have you. We know how busy you are. Uh, terrific presentation. I can't wait to see you live. I'm going to get you on Chatter That Matters podcast if you, if you have the time because I want, to, I want to be part of sharing that message. So thank you so much. Appreciate you, Tony. Thank you. Teresa, but just, uh, just as you put this together, Teresa, I just wanted to ask you a sense of, like, you know, as you thought about today and this whole concept of revive, rebuild, people first and such, you got to be happy with what you've, what's, what's come out of it. Yeah, um, I, even though this is a virtual event, I can feel, I can feel the connections. I was yelling one team. I, um, you know, I looked at my, uh, heart rate through some of the presentations and it was rising because I was so engaged and, uh, and I'm really hopeful that uh, some of our audience felt that too. I've seen some of the comments come through already and um, uh, it's been a really powerful day. So um, so um, honored to have all of the speakers join us and for you, Tony, to take us on this quest. Thank you so much. Right. I just wanted to give some final thoughts to the audience because the, the, the gauntlet that was put up, we invited you on a quest at the beginning. It was revive, rebuild, and, re and re-engage. Words are easily thrown around. It could be on a plaque, it could be dismissed. It's just another theme. But I think the thing that the hook, the connective tissue was people first. And when I look at Nova, Nicole coming up and right away talking about authentic leadership, and that's not the leadership of the past. That's a leader that listens, is transparent, is not afraid to say, I don't know. I haven't been through this either. And I look at uh, uh, Michelle Falcon, who, you know, that insight he got on the call center at 1-800-JUNK, laddering into a business and today saying, you know, I'm going to communicate twice as much. I personally, because I'm an entrepreneur, is going to embrace this because I was maybe taking things for, to, for advantage and was just complacent, but also realizing that there's a lot of people out there that aren't feeling the same way and they're feeling nervous and scared and, and uncertain and, and how he can, talks about bringing everybody together as one team. Al Johnson, I mean, one of the drop the mic moments talking about his grandmother and then actually reading some of that poem and, and really reminding us that you know, even though you think your purpose in life, in his case, might have been to, to, to nudge some stereotypes and to talk about fitness and mental well-being, but that he realizes that maybe his higher purpose nowadays is to really be part of this crusade to say we are all one together and, and don't get mad. And then Kim uh, coming in as an activist and, and you know, her, her brain and all the things she's doing. And I asked her, what's the most important thing? She said, I love it at the end when we hug. It's not because she was the most powerful speaker, which I imagine she is, but it was because she changed somebody's values. She moved somebody off of their biases. She, she, she did it one person at a time. And in Orlando, I mean, we could, I could cite a lot of this stuff, but I'll tell you something. If you don't go home and, and wake up in the middle of the night and go, how am I going to raise the floor? You haven't been paying attention. As I said at the beginning, attention is the oxygen of all human endeavor. This is National Speakers Bureau. Teresa Bacon is such a fan of putting great content out She's doing this because in these times, sometimes just hearing personal stories 
makes all the difference. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm Tony Chapman. Take a listen to the podcast, Chatter That Matters. Thank you again. Thank you, Tony. I really appreciate you pulling out those nuggets of wisdom and insight to encourage our audience to take action on what we've heard. Um, and to our speakers for taking us on this quest to care for ourselves, our teams, and our communities in such an inspiring and personal way. Um, this June especially is a reminder that there's much to acknowledge, learn, and act upon in honoring each other, including through Indigenous History Month, Pride Month, and Black Lives Matter. And sessions like these help us move forward about how we can contribute to the future. I want to thank our team that uh, helped bring this to life, our National Speakers Bureau team, um, especially Lynn on our team behind the scenes, and Ben Valkenberg Communications for streaming our event today on their live meeting platform. Thank you. Uh, and to our audience for uh, sharing your space with us this afternoon. Um, we hope it was meaningful for you and that you're able to um, act upon the notes that you took and share them with others so that we can all do our best to make the world a better place. Thanks so much for joining us and enjoy the evening.